both Mandy and Bruce touched upon the nature of knowledge and the way in which uh, it's passed on and listened to and heard and uh, sadly, more commonly, not listened to or heard. We seem to be living in an age uh, where expertise is rejected, whether it's Aboriginal expertise or women's expertise or climate scientists or economists or whatever. But the one exception to that seems to be in the world of food, where we choose to surround ourselves with people who are experts, who can uh, guide us through uh, the kitchen and the kitchen garden and beyond. And uh, we're hearing from one of those guides now. Matt Preston is an award-winning food journalist, restaurant critic and television personality, best known as a judge and co-host of MasterChef Australia. Preston is also senior editor for Delicious and Taste magazine. And MasterChef Australia is shown in over 170 countries around the world. That's extraordinary. Um, uh, from Venezuela and the Philippines to the Sudan, the UK and Scandinavia. A total worldwide audience of uh, over 180 million viewers. Um, it's also the highest rating English speaking program in India with over 3 million viewers. Um, making uh, Matt and Gary and George stars on the subcontinent. It's only a matter of time before there's a Bollywood film about them. Um, <laughs> Matt is going to talk to us about yams from a, a different perspective tonight. He's going to talk to us about true yams, finger yams, and the cultural importance of the yam in cultures such as Tonga and West Africa. Please make him very welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the Bunurong and the Wandari people, elders past and present. Um, I'm sitting here and we're using the word yam an awful lot, but they aren't yams. There is no more abused vegetable term, vegetable term in the world than the yam. Um, these, what you have here, are actually a relation to the cowpea or the mung bean. So they're, they're nothing to do with the yam. The one true yam is Western Australian yam. Um, it's, a, it's a West African yam you find in Nigeria and Ghana and that has also, you also find across Asia and Polynesia. And... It isn't just here that the word yam has been misappropriated. In New Zealand, the New Zealand yam is actually ocha, which is a, a relation of the oxalis um, plant. In um, Malaysia and in Singapore, the yam is actually taro. Um, in Southern America, candied yams are a big part of um, any kind of Thanksgiving feast. They're sweet potatoes. So we have this terrible thing about the yam. The weird thing about the yam is that it has this amazing power. Wherever it is and whichever version of that tuba or that tap root you find. Um, in Nigeria, the word yam comes from the Nigerian word for food because it's that important as a staple. Um, it's celebrated, it's uh, the, the, the festivals in Ghana and Nigeria for the beginning of the yam crop are the most important festivals um, in two of the big language groups there. And they, they are a time of coming together of the family as much as they are about the, the harvest. They're also a time for celebrating the, um, the biggest and largest yams that people can find, which is exactly the same thing that when you go to Tonga, you find there the largest yam is, is presented to, to the local chief or to the king. Um, in Tonga, the, the role of the yam, when, when the European explorers came to Tonga, um, they discovered the, the, the tan or the, the, the Tongan calendar, the, the notion of, of the, the 13 months, some, some years 12 months, some years 13 months, the tan, the time of year, the coming of the season was the Tongan term for the year. And if you look at the, the Tongan calendar, um, about eight of the 12 or 13 months are defined by times within the yam's life. So whether it's setting seeds or, or the, the breaking of the ground as the yam starts to swell up, or when the yams are taken out of the ground, or when the yam seeds are, when the yam seeds are be harvested, or when the yam seeds, if they are harvested in that month, go rotten. There's another, Aoa, which is. Um, and also the, the, the Polynesians, great explorers, used to navigate by the stars, or sadly, another part of great um, indigenous knowledge that has been lost as the GPS and the, and the, the compass has come into play. Um, but the significant star that navigated you from Fiji to Tonga was known by two names, two indigenous names. Um, the first being Finger of Yam and the second one being Extra Sweet Yam from a certain mountain in one of the Tongan islands. 
Um, so YAM has this kind of amazing significance and, and we see it here. What I love about the finger yam, the, the yam that, that kind of grows in a great sash from the Northern Territory, kind of down across Australia, down into New South Wales and around those kind of those, those upper edges of Western Australia, um, is that this is a, a strange plant when it comes to procreation. Um, the, the finger yam can, can survive in two bases. Under the ground, there are the tap roots and a seed system that lie there dormant, hidden, safe. And then on top are the leaves and the seed pods that kind of basically go out there and roam looking for plant sex in order to procreate. So we have this, this kind of, this one stay at home yam that's kind of there waiting if things go wrong. And we've got the other yam, the other part of the yam enjoying it. In terms, of a, in terms of the Australian yam, and there are three basic types of Australian yam, in terms of their culinary properties, um, these are tough to cook. If you overcook them, they go very hard. Um, they're earthy, they're sweet. They're probably not as great, as a, sadly, as a sweet potato, so it's unlikely that we're ever gonna see the yam come back into the, the, um, the, green, the green grocery section of your local supermarket as a staple crop. But one of the fascinating things that's happening in Australia at the moment has been, and this is, has been a connection, again, with indigenous ingredients um, as something to be proud of. The historically in Australia, they've become not a figure of fun, but, but not something with great, not something, it's become a tourist thing to buy, Kwandong chutney. It's, and not been valued for the, not been valued in a gastronomic way. And in the last four or five years, through guys like Jock Zonfalo at Orana in Adelaide, and also Ben Shiri here in Melbourne, we're starting to see some of these indigenous ingredients adopt a position on the menus as being truly local, which is, for me as a food critic, this is what I look for. I don't really want to go to a French restaurant in Melbourne. I want to go to a restaurant that reflects who we are and where we're from. And this is why this painting is so significant. For me, when I look at this painting, what, what it shows to me is this idea that, that food are the roots that we all put down. For, for so many people who have come here and we've lost, we lose our dress, we lose our language, um, we lose a lot of where we're from. The one thing that stays is the food. The one way, the, the ritual that we maintain, if you're Italian, it may be baking tomato sauce. If you're Croatian, it may be the annual pig kill. These are the way, if you're from an Anglo-Celtic background, it may be making, making the plum pudding. These are the way that we connect. We maintain those connections with with our heritage and our, our past. And I love this idea of who we are is on the surface, but underneath is, is the roots, and the roots are what the food are. Um, I think just listening to, especially what Mandy was saying today about maintaining culture, uh, one, of the, one of the hard things as a food writer about respecting indigenous Australia is that there are no cookbooks. There is no, there is no sense of there being a cuisine as there, there is for pretty much every other culture in terms of what we see in restaurants in Australia. And hopefully now this is starting to be seen. Chefs are going out and spending time with communities. And this is something that we're seeing in all over the world with places like Alex Atala at Dom, um, which is one of the top five restaurants in the world that were people actually coming out. There's a lovely story about Atala going up and um, meeting one of the indigenous tribes in the north of, in the north of Brazil. Um, and he met this woman and she was selling insects. Um, and he tried these insects. They were delicious, ants, they were delicious, a bit like our green ant. And they tasted like lemongrass and ginger. So he thought, well, it would be great, we'll bring this woman back and we'll bring her into my restaurant in Sao Paulo. So he came back and he started showing her ingredients from around the world. Um, and he put out on the table some lemongrass and some ginger. And he said to, he said to the woman, said, what does that taste like? And she said, that, my friend, just tastes like ant. <laughs> so for me, this is, this is where we have to get our head away from, is into valuing things, not from the perspective of 
the West African yam, but from the yam that we have here. Thank you very much indeed.